Hello, and welcome to the Markets Policy Macrocast. I'm John Fagan, your host, joined as always by Brendan Walsh, my markets policy partner in crime. Uh, and uh, we are uh, thrilled to be joined today by two esteemed gentlemen. We're welcoming, uh, first of all, recurring Macrocast contributor Mark Sobel, who is the chairman, U.S. chairman of the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum, the mighty OMFIF. Uh, Mark previously held senior positions at the U.S. Treasury and IMF with a focus on international monetary and financial policy. He was also my boss. Uh, so that was uh, that was that was a, I was I was a model employee, I'm sure. Um, you could do worse. <laughs> with him today is Steve Kamen joining us for the first time as a guest. Steve is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and previously was director of the Division of International Finance at the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, the two have published a joint uh, AEI economics working paper entitled Dollar Dominance is Here to Stay for the Foreseeable Future. The real issue for the global economy is how and why. Please see the show notes for a link to this excellent and very readable paper. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Uh, if you uh, could give us you know, your basic outline, summarize the paper and your conclusions, and then we'll jump into some Q&A. Great. Great. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, let me uh, go first and save the best for last or latter, as appropriate <laughs> English would have it. So um, why do we say the dollar is dominant and will remain so? A range of measures consistently underscore the dollar's dominant role in global private finance and official reserves. The currency denomination of international trade in regions, the dollar is basically 75% or higher, except in Europe. International bank loans, the dollar has long been around 60%, the euro 20%, yen sterling another 10%. International debt securities, around 70%, and the euro 20%. The dollar dominates the uh, use, uh, usage in foreign exchange transactions, according to the BIS's triennial surveys. And the most widely cited measure is the dollar's role in official reserves. There's good IMF data on this. In the mid-90s, the dollar's role share was about 60%, and that's kind of where it is now. It's fluctuated, of course. Um, this uh, The data don't include gold holding. There is evidence that gold is playing a small but greater role in holdings. Uh, market participants are also looking at uh, the margins for alternatives. Given interest in open liquid capital markets, uh, there's some gravitation towards Canadian and Australian dollars and Swiss francs. Um, but these markets are too small to accommodate major share changes. Uh, contrary to the impression that the RMB is a juggernaut, its share is under 3% in the reserve data. And also, some three quarters of foreign government holdings of US safe assets are held by countries with some form of military tie or bind to the US. Um, and of course, US allies are going to be far less inclined to uh, dump the dollar. Now, will the dollar remain dominant for the foreseeable future? Yes, uh, you follow markets closely, John. You've heard this phrase, Tina. Uh, there is no alternative. Or other people say, well, the dollar wins the least ugly contest. Um, so the dollar's dominant role reflects strengths uh, of the US. Uh, we have a huge economy. Uh, despite increasing lapses, the US generally has delivered sound macro performance. Our capital markets are the most open, deep, liquid in the world, um, offer a wide array of financing instruments, including treasuries, the world's risk-free asset. You can move money in and out in huge amounts with limited price impact. The transaction costs are low. The economy is open. The dollar is convertible. There's decent rule of law and investor protections. And then on top of that, you have network effects and inertia. So people around the world accept dollars. And then the large mega banks uh, of the United States power the global payments network. And the size and efficiency of the network reduce transaction costs for international payments, giving investors little practical incentive to change. Or as I say, if it ain't broke, why fix it? So now other currencies face challenges. Uh, second most widely used international currency is the Euro. Uh, the Euro area is a vast open economy like the US. But many uh, believe that the euro's global financing share remains around 20% and hasn't risen significantly because of, lack, because of the lack of a deep, liquid, sovereign euro bond market. And I distinguish that from 
markets and bunds or French oats or BTPs and things like that. So Europe's capital market union also uh, is in a fledgling state and the US economy is uh, more dynamic than Europe's. So many ask, well, couldn't the RMB become a major global economy? And I, I think this is the key currency to watch for the future. Um, China is reinforcing the RMB's international financial use with swap lines for many countries and striving to build out its cross-border interbank payment system. The PBOC, the People's Bank, will seek opportunities to liberalize uh, the financial system. Russia is going to lean heavily on RMB usage to circumvent Western sanctions. So uh, basically, I, I think that the RMB's uh, reserve role could rise to some degree from its roughly uh, current 3% uh, threshold uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, there have also been these fantastical discussions about a BRICS currency. I don't believe that for a second. That's not going anywhere. Uh, I don't see much usage or of expanded role in the future for the IMS special drawing right. Now, arguments are increasingly heard that improved payment systems, crypto, stablecoin, central bank digital currencies, including in China, which has been a leader on CBDCs, uh, that that could erode dollar dominance. Um, so improvements in the technology of cross-border payments could reduce the dollar's uh, vehicle currency role for international transactions, but crypto assets are highly volatile and unsuitable as a medium of exchange or a store of value, and governments are not really going to uh, tolerate their illicit use. Key stable coins such as Tether and Circle's USDC are tied to the dollar and backed by US dollar assets. That could be a dollar plus, in fact. And finally, improving the usage of currencies as a medium of exchange does not change the questions about the underlying properties I mentioned earlier, uh, such as rule of law. People are unlikely to use Chinese central bank digital currencies in scale if they cannot safely store their savings. Um, Last topic, many many fret that U.S. weaponization of financial sanctions will undercut the dollar. So dollar dominance does, in fact, give the U.S. leverage over others. Uh, but there is a difference between using financial sanctions multilaterally with our allies in support of a strategic objective, as clearly has been done with the blocking of Russian central bank and oligarch assets, versus the U.S. using financial sanctions unilaterally and at every turn. I don't think the former is going to hurt the dollar significantly. Uh, I think the Biden administration has worked well with our allies in financial sanctions. Um, you can argue that beyond the West, uh, our alliance ties, others such as China will fret. Uh, but as mentioned, um, three quarters of dollar safe assets are held by countries with some alliance ties to the U.S. And uh, China's portfolio managers have typically been professional, technical, and there's aren't that aren't great alternatives to dollar markets. Um, so again, the U.S. must use financial sanctions responsibly and recognize that abuse could be harmful to the dollar's role. But I don't think proper multilateral use uh, will uh, greatly impact the dollar's uh, dominant role. I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Over to Steve. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. Uh, so as Mark has explained, uh, you know, we think the dollar is going to likely remain the dominant currency for the foreseeable future. Uh, but the next sections of the paper that I'm going to describe explain how even if the dollar were to lose its dominant uh, global position, that doesn't necessarily imply big losses to either the U.S. or the global economy. And a great deal depends on why, if the dollar were to lose its dominant position, why that would happen. So let's first focus on the benefits that the dominant dollar provides to the United States. Now, in the 1960s, the French used the term exorbitant privilege uh, to describe how the U.S. could use its dollars to buy all kinds of things overseas without having to sell a commensurate amount of stuff to foreigners. And we agree that the dollar does indeed provide certain privileges to the United States economy, but we disagree that those benefits are so great that be would be labeled exorbitant. So let's kind of like tick through a number of the benefits that the dominant dollar does afford. And we'll start with the most obvious, which is seniorage. Okay. So about a trillion bucks are held in U.S. cash money overseas. 
if foreigners were holding U.S. treasuries instead of the cash money, uh, and assuming they were they'd get paid four percent per year for that, that would cost the U.S. Treasury an additional forty billion bucks. That's that's basically the seniorage amount, and that sounds like a lot, uh, but it's actually only 015 percent of GDP. So a material but not huge benefit to the U.S. Probably a more important benefit of the dominant dollar is how it might actually lower the uh, rate of interest that the U.S. Treasury pays on all of its bonds, which makes sense given the safety and liquidity of U.S. Treasury bonds. Uh, but how much uh, are those cost savings as a result of the dominant dollar? And that's the thing that nobody knows. Now, what our paper does is, in a very simple way, looks at real treasury, treasury yields in the U.S. compared to Japan and Germany. And as it turns out, over the last couple of decades, real yields in the States tend to be at least as high and often higher than in those two other major economies. So this suggests that whatever cost benefit is associated uh, for the United States with the dominant dollar it's probably not all that great. Now, a third possible advantage of the dominant dollar is that by boosting the demand for dollars, it also boosts its value. That, can, that basically leads to larger current account deficits and allows the U.S. to live beyond its means, the thing the French were criticizing us for. Uh, and that, that uh, channel, again, makes sense directionally. But the size of any overvaluation is, again, very unclear. Okay, The United States is hardly the only country uh, in the world to run very large and persistent uh, current account deficits. Uh, it's averaged about 3% of GDP over the last few decades, a little lower, actually, than Turkey and Australia, and a little bit higher than UK and South Africa. Uh, but again, not huge. And on top of that, a higher dollar and bigger deficits isn't necessarily a, an, an uh, unalloyed benefit to the states. It leads to protectionist pressures. It leads to a loss of competitiveness. And finally, some observers point to the benefit of the dominant dollar uh, in terms of providing insulation for our economy against external shocks. Uh, but that, too, is a mixed bag. On the one hand, having our imports in voice and dollars is helpful. Changes in the dollar exchange rate have less of an impact on import prices and inflation. And on top of that, during crisis times, uh, you know, uh, because the dollar is a flight to uh, safety currency, uh, capital inflows tend to buoy the dollar and reduce interest rates, which can be handy. But on the other hand, that same rise in the dollar makes U.S. exporters less competitive, competitive and also lowers the dollar value of U.S. investments overseas. So to kind of like to summarize, yes, the U.S. enjoys some benefits uh, from the dominant dollar, uh, but we'd hardly regard those as exorbitant. The paper then turns to cost and benefits of the dominant dollar for the rest of the global economy. And here, an awful lot of observers actually emphasize the costs to the global economy more than the benefits. They argue that because of dollar dominance, the monetary policy decisions of the Federal Reserve exert an undue influence on the rest of the world. And they also note that because much of the world's exports are invoiced in dollars, increases in the value of the dollar make those exports more expensive around the world and lead to a contraction in world trade. Again, directionally, there's something to be said for those arguments. But without getting into the weeds here, we're not convinced that either of these concerns are really first order problems, and they're likely to be superseded by the benefits to the world uh, of having a dominant currency. Uh, it reduces transactions costs and it reduces uncertainty by providing a common unit of account, means of exchange, and store of saving. And if those uh, phrases sound familiar, they're the exact same reasons why money is viewed as an improvement over barter in the domestic context. So presumably having a dominant currency has actually encouraged a higher level of global trade, investment, and economic activity. And so if you like globalization, you should like the dominant dollar, or at least any suitable dominant currency. So this brings us uh, to basically the ultimate question, which is what would it matter if the dollar lost its dominant position? 
And uh, as our title of our paper, which is almost longer than the paper itself suggests, uh, the answer to that question, as in all things in economics, is it depends. If the loss in dollar dominance owed to improvements in financial technology that reduce the need for the dollar in cross-border payments, that would increase the efficiency and dynamism of the global economy and likely be a plus for everybody. Uh, on the other hand, if the loss of dollar dominance reflected a broader geoeconomic fragmentation uh, of the global economy into isolated trading and financial blocks, probably revolving around the US and China, uh, that would be a blow to global trade productivity and economic growth. And then finally, I turn to the scenario that Mark and I are most concerned about, uh, which is uh, a severe deterioration in the U.S. fiscal, financial, and economic situation, reflecting polarization and dysfunction of our political system. Uh, if the result of that is a sustained rise in inflation, a crowding out of private investment, heightened financial volatility, and ultimately a reduction in the dynamism of the U.S. economy, then the loss of dollar dominance that would re result from all that would indeed be the least of our worries, as well as those of the rest of the world. So with that, I might pass the baton back to Mark, to see if he wants to say any final words on that issue. Well, just very quickly, uh, what I would what I always say is that the biggest threat to dollar dominance is the United States of America. So we can get our act together and behave like responsible adults, or we can mess up, as you outlined, and uh, the choice is ours. But as you also say, Steve, if we mess up, dollar dominance is the least of our problems. We have met the enemy, and he is us. <laughs> Excellent, gentlemen. Thank you. It very cogently argued and uh, and analyzed. And uh, just wanted to uh, throw a few questions your way and get your reactions. So essentially, it seems as though what you're saying is the dollar dominance is, you know, by all metrics, really still very much uh, in the the prevailing dynamic. Uh, though you did allude to the fact that you know the FX uh, FX reserves. Uh, the tables in the uh, in the paper don't include gold and gold is potentially, you know, it seems to be coming up relatively uh, uh, more strongly recently. Obviously, we can see the gold prices hitting record and so forth. Bitcoin uh, and uh, and Tether, you alluded to those as well, those alternate payment systems. So is it fair to say that the dollar can still maintain dominance, uh, particularly against fiat currency uh, competitors, but still lose ground on sort of a relative basis to the overall uh, payments and, and reserves uh, uh, market? Well, John, as you know, the world is awash in money and um, people are seeking uh, diversification uh, always. Um, but basically, uh, my, my, so I, I understand where you're going, but I think basically the magnitudes involved here are uh, definitely very small and at the margins. Gold, of course, is not very liquid or usable. Uh, Bitcoin goes up or down here here today, gone tomorrow, uh, not a store of value. Tether, as I mentioned, could be uh, a plus for the dollar. So, so basically, I, I think this is really at the margins. I, I would add, well, add a couple of things. First of all, Bitcoin, Tether, you know, those types of crypto assets, they're not actually part of official reserve assets at all, uh, nor are they, for the most part, uh, held as reserve assets, uh, you know, by countries, uh, El Salvador notwithstanding. Um, but but also more broadly, I think, I think it's important to think about like the share of currencies in foreign exchange, in official foreign exchange reserves as more of an indication of the uh, international role of the dollar rather than an actual embodiment of it, right? I mean, I mean, the dollar is the dominant currency, not so much because foreign governments hold it, although that's part of it, as because it's used in a myriad financial transactions and stores of value by private parties. And, and the quantities there completely overwhelm the amount that's actually held as foreign exchange reserves. Just as a, as a side question from, 
the perspective of let's say let's say China to achieve maybe their goal isn't necessarily to supplant the dollar as the globally dominant uh, reserve currency, but to have enough of a enough depth in the RMB um, international uh, payment system and uh, and and reserve uh, situation to you know create you know, the ability to effectively circumvent uh, U.S. dollar sanctions and uh, and other things. Is there something f- far short of, of you know, reserve currency status for the renminbi that still achieves uh, what uh, the sort of axis of resistance, so to speak, uh, wants to achieve? Well, uh, that is a great question. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure China is angling to become a dominant reserve currency anyway. I think um, I see it more ultimately playing a greater uh, regional currency role. Um, you know, I think China would want to be very careful about playing the circumvention for the axis of evil uh, uh, game. And the axis of evil countries are really puny when you put up, put, add up their economic weight. Whereas when you um, think about China, it's very heavily involved in the global economy. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, fragmentation. The IMF's written a lot about the world breaking into blocks, kind of reminiscent of you know the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact against NATO and 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 the West. But um, I'm not sure that's the right model. Uh, you know, I, I think we've reached maybe a peak of globalization, but trade flows are still huge, um, especially out of China. And I think China doesn't want to uh, or has to be very cautious in not wanting to jeopardize that. And you've already seen some Chinese uh, firms that are uh, uh, pulling back from interacting with Russia, you know, according to media reports. Uh, for fear of tripping uh, U.S. Uh, sanctions. So, yeah, I, I see a stepped-up role for the RMB, as I made in my remarks. I see a stepped-up regional role more than anything else, but um, but I don't see it trying to uh, create its own dynamic to circumvent the, the dollar. But I could always be wrong. Mm. Well, uh, well, yeah, I mean, we do flag this kind of geoeconomic fragmentation as a risk, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, so, I mean, it is, um, and I think that, I mean, clearly, I mean, China's interested uh, in a more international role for its currency, and it seems to be interested in kind of like uh, strengthening relations uh, with what I like to call the axis of evil countries. (laughs) So the combination of those two things could lead, you know, to that fragmentation that we're talking about. I think I think Mark is correct in, in noting that from a purely economic standpoint, um, you know, it doesn't make sense for China to push that too far. Uh, but it's a little bit unclear exactly what are the goals of the Chinese leadership. Uh, not clear that Putin is doing his country any favor economically. Uh, so, you know... Yeah. Uh, it's a, well, it's, a great, it's, it's a great point. I know you mentioned the, the axis. I I said the axis of resistance. I prefer the axis of evil, but uh, I don't know. I've, I've been workshopping some other uh, maybe uh, legion of losers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a, you know, you wouldn't want to be associated with a legion of losers. Uh, but, you know, when you look at North Korea and uh, and Iran and uh, Syria and, and Russia and think, you know, associate, you get you get, uh, you know, you know, someone by the company they keep. Uh, but uh, moving on to a, a separate question, you mentioned Tether. It may not be rising to the level of uh, threatening the dollar itself, even it's pegged to the dollar, but it is a uh, it is supposedly backed by dollar assets. Is it? Uh, there's a lot of question marks around that saw the headline that it's reached a hundred a hundred billion and this is you know tether is is well outside uh the uh the the bounds of sort of you know u.s accounting uh regulatory clutches and oversight and so forth how should regulators think about uh about tether and and stable coins generally you know from the idea that they can potentially create dollar liquidity uh out of you know (laughs) <laughs> out of maybe maybe not exactly one to one dollar assets. 
Well, uh, I don't have much to say on this, John, but I would basically say they should regulate uh, stable coins like bank deposits or the 2A7 uh, government uh, short-term money market funds, as far as I'm concerned. But that's all I have to say on the matter. Regulate like bank deposits, but uh, there's no uh, insurance for those. Uh, I, I mean, I, let's put it this way. For sure, they should be regulated in terms of uh, ensuring that they're absolutely transparent and accountable as to what backs the, what, as to what backs the stable coins. Uh, beyond that, I think it's, I'm a I'm a little bit kind of like, you know, not sure uh, about whether more investor protections are needed or not. I mean, on the one hand, you you could you could regulate them like money market funds or something. Uh, or on the other hand, you can make it clear that this is the wild west of investing, uh, investors invest, uh, at their own peril and, and leave it at that. Got it. Just, uh, related to, to stable coins, CBDCs, it was something that you alluded to in the paper, the innovation and so forth. And the, the Fed has, you know, sort of shown its cards, maybe the minds will change, but, uh, essentially the the sense you get uh, from Fed publications is they think that uh, CBDC is a is a solution looking for a problem, uh, and that uh, you know the current setup of the uh, and and the innovations uh, with you know more real time payments and so forth being capable, uh, you know through uh, through the Fed's innovations that you know what's the what's the purpose of a CBDC? Where do you both come down on the on the question of you know justification utility um, you know the, even the wisdom of of, uh, of a government, maybe not necessarily the U.S., but uh, any government setting up its own CBDC. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm with the Fed uh, on the value of CBDCs for an advanced economy like the U.S. So if we look at developing economies or emerging market economies, a lot of them have large numbers of unbanked people, highly concentrated banking systems, very large informal sectors. I think that for those countries, uh, creation of a CBDC combined with government programs for financial outreach and, and, and supporting greater competition in the financial sector uh, could be could be a useful approach. And, and in fact, the you know the countries that have adopted or are, are most likely to adopt CBDCs tend to be in the developing realm. Uh, for countries like the United States, uh, with a moderately competitive financial sector, very low numbers of unbanked, and already lots of private digital payments alternatives. Uh, you know, I agree, uh, CBDC at the moment doesn't seem all that useful. I, I would note that centuries from now, when we've got colonies on Mars and the asteroids, and maybe we're heading to other stars, uh, you could imagine that in that context, when you get off your spaceship and walk into a bar and buy a drink, uh, seems like you know, pulling out paper money out of your wallet seems a little bit anachronistic. So my point being that at some point, we probably will have CBDCs, uh, but not clear they're needed now. Yeah, what 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 currency is accepted at the Star Wars cantina? Exactly, <laughs> right. exactly. Nice. Uh, let's see, going, going back to, you know, the policy outlook, we have you know, we have some idea of what a, a a Trump second term economic policy would look like. Uh, we have some idea, obviously, what a what a Biden second term uh, economic policy setup would look like. Though so much is dependent on how uh, the outcomes of uh, of the Senate and House um, races is, and and the balance that results. Where do you when you stack up these two against each other? Um, you know, such as we can understand them uh, at this point. What is the what's the is there is there an approach that you think is uh, uh, better for the dollar uh, dollar dominance? Is there a, is there one candidate that's more of a more bullish for the dollar than the other? Well, um, for, uh, focusing on the international role of the dollar rather than the the foreign exchange value of the dollar, uh, I think that uh, the Trump a second Trump administration uh, offers a number of important downsides. Uh, first of all, uh, the threat to substantially increase tariffs, uh, you know, is going to not only pose a blow to the global, to the U.S. and global economies, uh, but will very visibly uh, kind of like weaken uh, the reputation of the United States as a 
as a, a responsible actor in the global economy. And uh, I can assume uh, that a second Trump administration will also uh, be much more inclined to pursue unilateral sanctions and actions of that sort, uh, which will also diminish, uh, you know, uh, you know, basically the reputation as uh, of the country as a responsible global actor, uh, you know, and so, and and you know, for both of those reasons, um, I think it reduces the incentive for countries to kind of like align with the U.S. and increases their incentive uh, to align, uh, you know, with the other side if that other side is China. Uh, so the Biden administration, uh, you know, don't love all their policies, but I think that in terms of, you know, acting as a responsible global economic and political actor, uh, that that tends to be more supportive of the global, of the, you know, of a continued dominant role for the dollar. Great questions. Uh, it's, this is the first time we've been asked this one. So I pretty much totally agree with, uh, with Steve here. Uh, there's a part of me that says, Let's wait till November. I don't even want to think about this matter. But uh, that having been said, I would say a policy of supporting allies, not hugely rap ratcheting up protectionism, less unilateralism, and keeping trust in the U.S. is probably better for the dollar than trashing our allies' huge protectionism, let alone making our fiscal deficits even bigger and more unsustainable. I'll let you figure out who I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah. On that point of fiscal deficits, you know, the constituency for for fiscal reduction, uh, you know, is it seems to be pretty, pretty narrow these days. Uh, and uh, what let's leave aside what's politically possible. What would you what would you advocate, um, you know, would be the most impactful? Uh, the And then and what what do you and then among. Yeah, and then let's get back to reality. What is what do you think is actually achievable if the next administration does want to do something about about the deficit? So, OK, so the ideal and the realism. Those are not the same. Uh, look, you know, I think given where we are, we need to uh, raise revenue and slow spending growth and put the U.S. on a gradual consolidation course without uh uh, so much consolidation as to be very disruptive for the economy. You know, we can finance deficits of a uh, net debt of 100% of GDP. It goes over the next decade to about 115, according to the CBO estimates. Uh, you know, I think that's quite financeable for the United States, but I'm not, I, I don't think it's a good policy personally. Uh, I'd rather see us gradually consolidate. Um, and, um, what do I expect? Uh, I expect uh, nothing. I don't see the political stars aligning. Uh, you know, one one party is for uh, says no new taxes. The other one says, well, we'll tax people over four hundred thousand dollars income, but that's like two percent of households. Um, and uh, nobody wants to touch uh, entitlements, which are two thirds of the budget. And when you think about the other third of the budget, uh, half, almost half of that's defense and the interest bill is rising. Um, so I, I don't I don't see any political wherewithal to tackle this. Uh, and nor do I see a uh, bond vigilant bond vigilante crisis uh, any anytime soon. Could be wrong. Um, that might shake things up. Um, so. There we have it. Little little action, bad fiscal policy. That, that's my takes. I agree completely with Mark. Here's a contrarian thought. Second Trump administration. Nixon goes to China. Trump raises taxes. Reduces the deficit. Now that we had a we had an exact opposite formulation of our like totally out of the money option, which was a second Biden term is the one who tackles entitlement reform because of that exact Nixon in China. Only someone as you know unimpeachably liberal as President Biden can tackle something like common sense entitlement reform, raising the retirement age or something like that. But uh, it's, it's interesting that we had uh, differing, differing approaches to, uh, to the Nixon in China formulation. 
Well, I think that if you want unimpeachable, Trump's got to be the guy. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well, thank you, gentlemen. This is very uh, illuminating and uh, and and worthwhile discussion about uh, about the the global reserve currency uh, once in future. Uh, global reserve currency, the mighty dollar. Um, last uh, last words. We would we would we we can't let you go without getting some ideas on the macro picture here. Uh, when you look at uh, at the Fed policy outlook, we got some more information from uh, from Chair Powell and his testimony yesterday. And uh, and you know we keep getting economic data. We got a big jobs number tomorrow. There's a lot of faith in the soft landing story that's baked into financial markets. Where do you Gents, come down on the Fed outlook and the uh, uh, global economic and U.S. economic outlook from here. Well, to me, the key uh, phrase to understanding uh, Fed policy going forward, and as it has been, is asymmetric risks. If uh, if the you know if inflation picks up again and stays up. Chair Powell, you know, goes down in history like another Arthur Burns. If, on the other hand, there's a mild or moderate recession and unemployment rate goes from 3.7 to something that's still not high by historical standards, 4.5 or 5, gets a little flack, but it's really not a biggie. So all that suggests that with the economy still, you know, U.S. economy, still showing you know considerable momentum and and estimates of its growth in this year seem to be rising uh the fed's going to do what powell said which is it's going to be very patient and uh and it's going to wait to see a very sustained uh movement inflation uh to the target uh before it does any really substantial loosening you know uh as even though i'm former treasury I'm not allowed to talk about monetary policy. It's <laughs> sacred, and you know, I, I leave it to the secret of the temple and the oracle of Mister Cayman. Excellent. Well, that's a uh, the the patience of the Fed. It's it's been on display on display so far. And certainly, the uh, the pushback has gotten markets uh, much more aligned with where the Fed had been uh, versus where they were late uh, late last year. Thinking about you know a March start uh, and uh, you know 150 basis points of easing, they've come off that, but uh, you know the markets are still positioned for more aggressive uh, cuts than the Fed is projecting at this point. Um, we're with you. We're uh, we're expecting that July is the first, but with a bias toward later and slower, uh, and uh, that is you know commensurate with a view that we've got about you know relatively sticky, but problems with that last mile. Like the two to two to three percent inflation fight, not wanting to declare victory too early, and uh, the U.S. economy beginning to slow down, uh, without you know, with the consumer beginning to tire out a little bit, and uh, and you know, creating at least you know the the whiff of stagflation may not be all that uh, all that pungent in the U.S., but maybe a little bit uh, heavier in in other markets, uh, you know, Europe, U.K. Uh, potentially as well. So. Uh, that's uh, that's where we stand. Uh, any any last uh, any last words, gentlemen, before we uh, before we wrap it up? None from me. Just to thank you again for uh, hosting us and letting us get out the word about our paper, so that another two people may read it. <laughs> Absolutely, that paper again. You'll find the link in the notes to this podcast. That paper again is the American Enterprise Institute uh, publication. Dollar dominance is here to stay for the foreseeable future. The real issue for the global economy is how and why. Thank you so much, Steve Kamen and Mark Sobel. We really appreciate your insights and coming on the Markets Policy Macrocast. Well, thanks so much. Thank you.